Ah, welcome to Fishing Without Bait, a podcast about a lifetime without definitive expectations, where the only entrance fee is the honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness to try. What we're helping people do is to not find themselves, but however to create themselves through our concept of what we call full impact mindfulness. So, if you're ready to jump in a canoe and paddle, let the adventure begin. Oh, by the way, my name is Jim Eller Meyer. I'm a behavioral health therapist. And as promised in this program, what we do is we like to bring back uh, guests who uh, to, to update their lives and share some more recent adventures that they've had. And today we're honored. Our good friend, uh, Tara Vieira, is back on with us. So welcome back, Tara. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to be back. Well, as we say in the 12-step world, Tara, it's better to be seen than viewed. So here we are. Uh, could you give us a little update on your life? The last time we went there, you had uh, started the uh, recordings of uh, AA leads on keepcomingback.net. Uh, so tell us where you're at with that now. Yeah, so keepcomingback.net is my 12-step work. And what I do is post a new speaker tape every Thursday. So every week I'm recording a story experience strength and hope just like you would hear in a 12-step meeting and it's uninterrupted so unlike a podcast format like this is where we're going back and forth it's somebody sharing their story for about 45 minutes uninterrupted and you're on there I'm on there and then when they're all done I ask them a few questions so I try to make each episode a total of an hour and so they usually share for about 45 minutes. And episode 207 will post this Thursday. It's great service work. And it's just a smooth machine now. How do you find the leads? Well, it's not hard to find an alcoholic willing to talk about themselves. <laughs> well, that tells me that you must be connected with the community. I am connected and I have... Um, when people offer to to donate, because it's there's obviously, as you know, a cost to keep this stuff up, and I cannot accept any financial anything because it's twelve step work. So, in lieu of donations, I encourage people to send me send me your sponsors, send me your sponsee, send me someone from your home group, and so I'm always asking for more people. Okay, that's uh, that sounds great. So the thing about it is the connectivity. Uh, I was talking to somebody. Oh, actually, yesterday, Tara, and they were telling, and they, they were an earth person, but a lovely earth person, and they were talking to me about uh, 12-step recovery being a self-help group, and I tried to explain that if we could help ourselves, we wouldn't need meetings, and we wouldn't mm -hmm. need a sponsor, and we wouldn't need a book, and that the first word in the literature is we. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I, my husband has said the same thing. He's like, it's just a self-help support group. And like, well, it's not really. Well, it's just like church. Like, well, no, it's not really. There's probably not a term that would encompass what we are and that would explain it to somebody who's not experienced it, right? So we know the power and the magic in the rooms and the healing work that happens through conversation and through connections and through vulnerability and through recovery, watching someone come in and, and heal. Uh, just amazing, beautiful things happen. And it's hard to call that a self-help group. It's hard to call that church. It's hard to call that anything but what it is, um, which can only really be understood by experiencing it. So I like what you said that it, that to experience the magic. It's so true. There was this newcomer that came in and and basically got all the way to a divorce, moved out of his house, got some time under his belt. And I just found out yesterday that he is moving back in the house with the wife and the kids and has a couple of years sobriety now. So he's not that new, but we watched him come in after his DUI and, and then go through the turmoil and then all the way back to 
back with the children and the wife and moving back in on the first. So it's just magical things. Miracles happen in the rooms, things that that only uh, not just sobriety, sobriety, but the process of recovery, right? The all of the things we do to to maintain our recovery. Because I could not drink um, and be miserable. Actually, that is the worst place to be, to be not drinking and to not have serenity. That is a terrible, because you'd no longer have your tool that got you to function or, or handle anything. So you take away that and you got to, I got to replace it with all kinds of stuff, um, including the rooms and the people and the connection, even when I'm not in the mood for it. And that actually, I would say that even goes into my personal life because I'll commit to something and I don't want to do it, but the rooms (laughs) have taught me, well, if you commit, you show up anyway. And I go to said event or said fundraiser or said whatever, and I leave a different person. I leave a better person for having just shown up and adulting well is not always easy for for me. And when I do, I get rewarded with peace, serenity, better night's sleep. What you described uh, earlier about is... Dr. Silkworth describes it as being restless, irritable, and discontent, Tara. It's a terrible, terrible feeling to be restless, irritable, and discontent. Yes, it is. And I've, uh, I was actually talking to somebody today, and uh, it took me a year and a half. It took us a year and a half of pl- me planting seeds that this person finally went to a rehab, got clean and sober, and on May the 2nd, they'll be clean and sober for seven months. And it's it certainly is a miracle, and they, they did this all by themselves. But uh, Tara, I want to throw a thought out there for you that sometimes I talk about, and that it's a misnomer that uh, people have the view that 12-step recovery is all about alcohol or drugs or gambling or the other hundred groups that use the behavioral techniques. Uh, It's about a change in your thoughts and a change in your actions. Uh, The first step is the only one that mentions addiction. And like we've talked about the last time, everyone is in recovery from something. So then after that first step, it gets to work on yourself. What's your thoughts about that? I do. I do. I love and hate that I came to the rooms to stop drinking, but I actually found a a way to properly be human. It's, it's the principles of the program. Each step has a principle, um, and living a life with these principles is just, it's a half price life. It's just easier. It's, it's, um, I had to get the drinking out of the way in order to show up for the other steps. So step one is let's remove this crutch, this thing you've been using to get get through being human. Let's remove that and take, get that out so that we can then look at how you're thinking, how you're behaving, what choices you're making, how you're reacting to the world in sobriety I react to the world in a completely different way because I'm coming from a different place. I'm, I'm not constantly thinking the way I used to be thinking. For example, myself, <laughs> how is this going to impact me? How does this affect me? So to your point, it is thinking. And it's um, like we talked about before we started recording, we talked about just keeping our side of the street clean. And so the steps are a people say like, I don't know, parenting doesn't come with a book or life doesn't come with a book. And like, but they actually does come with steps. There are great steps that anybody can follow and practice and they can live a, a, they can live a pretty good life of happy, joyous, and free, even in the face of the worst. I have someone who recently shared on keep coming back's daughter died and he faced it in the most amazing beautiful way possible. My sponsor is on her deathbed. She has a couple of months left and she is facing it with the most dignity and grace that I've ever seen in a human. And it's at a time of her death. So it's just, it's a way of living. It's just, we had to get the alcohol out of the way first. 
We talked about uh, 12-step recovery being a discipline and a design for living. Uh, it's just, it's not like, like we discussed on our last podcast together. It's not like joining the Elks Club or the Girl Scout. It's a, it is a commitment. Dr. Silkworth in his uh, talk talks about that unless a person experiences an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of their recovery. Uh, and I love to talk about the four horsemen of addiction, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. So tell me, Tara, about your experiences with the four horsemen and how you overcame them. Well, terror, I, uh, I was driven by fear and anxiety and I, I was motivated by it. That was just what drove me. Everything was to prevent a catastrophe or to clean one up. And that's how I grew up. I did not know that life was any other way except fear driven. And it's not anymore. It's not anymore at all. If I'm fearful of something, it's a huge red flag to pause, step back. What's going on? What am I afraid of? Where do I think I made a bad decision? Like what, what's happening here for this, this feeling of fear? Um, what is it? Terror, bewilderment? Yes. I'm really kind of bullshitting here, but I'm going to do my best. I would imagine that I'm not super familiar with all four of these. So, but the idea of bewilderment, I think I had, and I still do. I was completely oblivious to my role in the happenings in my life where I once thought it was happening to me or they did it to me or they should have. I was very unaware of my character defects. I'm still quite unaware of some of them. If I knew all of them, I would, I would, I would not probably do well. Um, so I think this is where the rooms and my daily re I do read, I read, quite a bit. I, all of the practices I do to stay connected to the universe is a form of communication for me. So when I'm, when I read my, whatever I'm going to read that day, whatever book I pick up to read a page or two, uh, I try to open up to whatever, whatever clarity I need now. And, you know, some people, including me, have different sets of cards. Like I have technically I have tarot cards, but I also have like earth cards and you can pull just an earth card and it'll say, you need to go outside and put your feet in the dirt and ground yourself. And, you know, so I kind of use all these little fun and more serious and less serious and formal tools to get clarity and going to meetings is probably where I get a lot of my information because every time I should have listened to our last episode before I came on because I don't remember anything we talked about. I hope I'm not repeating myself. Um, but I walk into meetings and I say a little prayer. I say, all right, universe, God, whatever, mom, help me hear what I need to hear today and help me say what needs to be heard. And I go into each meeting and I, because the meetings I go to, every single person talks every single week. So I get to um, just sit and listen diligently to what everybody has to say. And to me, that is my higher power speaking through others to me to help with that bewilderment. What's the next one? Frustration. Oh, yeah. What's the last one? I'm going to skip that despair. one right now. Despair. despair. I think we're all familiar with despair. Yeah. I, despair is probably not um, one that I do well with because I'm one of those that my faith is um, I think about my faith a lot. I spend a lot of time thinking about, about God and my spirit guides and my ancestors and for my sponsor dying, there's no despair there. Um, with a child dying, there would be despair. Um, but Nor the normally what the, the four horsemen are is when we're in full bloom in our addiction. Oh, 
Well, I don't think I deal with any of those anymore, not in my addiction. That's correct. So what I tell people is to be proud of themselves because they've dealt with the four horsemen. They've looked their, the four horsemen in the eyes and successfully passed them. See, now I got confused because in my little Emmett Fox, my little buddy Emmett Fox, he talks about the four horsemen, but it's not those four horsemen. Mm. Those are the four horsemen that are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So there's the four horsemen of the Bible, right? The, Correct. The horsemen, the red and white and... Yeah, famine, war. All right. Well, don't ask me questions I don't know the answer to. <laughs> Making me look stupid. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, the whole idea about this thing, there's no right and there's no wrong. Fair enough. Our main purpose is to do the next right thing. So tell me about how you're feeling or when you found out about your, your sponsor's condition. Um, I have, I've had two deaths in the last, last year, two friends of mine had passed away, uh, July and then in March and they were both too young to be dying. And, and it was, it was hard. It was hard. Both of those were hard and they both were sober. They were not people in the rooms. They were both normies. And my sponsor is 70, going to be 70 next week. And she's lived a full sober life and her kids are grown. And my first reaction was shock. And I cried a lot. I don't cry. So it's, it's rare that I get a good cry. And then I, processed it for about a day. And then I called her and I said, okay, well, I'm talking to you every single day until the end. And so I talked to her now, I don't know, an hour, at least an hour every day. And, um, it's just beautiful to watch. Well, I and think, I'll be going out there to see her here in a few weeks. Well, it sounds like, uh, your sponsor is presenting and modeling behavior for others. She is. She is doing such an amazing job. She had been in outs with her. She's a triplet. So she has two oh. sisters and then she has another sister, an original triplet, natural triplet. And she, she, they all came out. They hadn't spoken for years and she let them come out and she just let bygones be bygones and had a beautiful week with them as beautiful as can be expected with four sisters together. Ah. Um, but yeah, she's, she's amazing. And I never thought I want to die with dignity and grace. Like it never dawned on me to want that, but watching her do it, I'm like, I want that. I want that. Well, one of the things we say in the 12 step world that our, our fondest desire is to die sober. Yeah. And we discussed earlier about my own conditions, my congestive heart failure issues in the past. I think most of the uh, listeners know about that. But we were talking about by working the program and going through those steps to have no fear of death, not volunteering for it, but however, having no fear of death. Could you, we, you gave some beautiful statements about that, Tara. What did I say about death? About, about not fearing death. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think that, um, so we, we talked about keeping our side of the street clean. And when we have our side of the street clean, we, we, we have a weight lifted off of us when it comes to death. We don't have amends to make. We don't have, oh, I better call that person now or else I'll never get a chance. We don't, we don't have any of that. We've already done all of that. We've already cleaned it all up. And in the meantime, the subsequent steps, or actually the preceding steps, step two and three, and then and then subsequently in step 11, we're then building our relationship with our higher power or whatever that may be. And so I think for death, we've done all of the life work we can do. So there's no, there's no need to fear death. I don't fear death. Um, my husband doesn't believe me, but I don't. <laughs> I don't fear death. I, I don't, I, I, I fear, I would fear leaving my children. Um, I have a nine, 12 and 26 year old. Yes. 20. Is that right? 
26 year old. And uh, I would fear leaving all, all of them. They're too young, but, um, but I don't fear death for me. I think that's a, that's a powerful statement about 12 step recovery is having no regrets. Yeah. Right. No regrets. That's going to be my next tattoo. Actually, I was, I just got cleared by the cardiologist. I can start getting tattoos again. I don't, I don't know where to put it at Tara, but I've, uh, your I heard, forehead has some space. there. <laughs> you know, my daughter has forbidden me to get face tattoos. Oh, uh, fair enough. So, well, in fact, I mean, she has forbidden me. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to get some at some point, but I heard someone say that, uh, you know that you've made a complete ninth step when you can answer your phone. Mm. Yeah. You don't even have to look at the number. You just answer the phone. Yeah. yeah I don't even think about that anymore, about the days where you would look and like, oh, no, I'm not answering that. Yeah. Or you go to the grocery store and you see somebody coming down the aisle and you make a quick U-turn. Doesn't happen. Doesn't, ha doesn't happen anymore, does it? And that's what no. we're talking about, clearing up the wreckage of the past. And what we're talking about is having no fear. We're going to continue our conversation on the next podcast with Tara Vieira and a free prescription that you can cash anywhere. Fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Unplug your television and take up fishing. And for a truly mindful experience, we suggest that you fish without bait. Do a kindness for yourself and do a kindness for another. Forgive yourself and forgive another. If we're all not God's children, none of us are. Till all are free, none are free. Namaste. If you're interested in flying the colors of fishing without bait, click the shop icon on our website, we have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.